Why not skip the mess of having a real pet and just have one in augmented reality? That's what we're going to show you how to do today as we build a demo of an AR pet experience. In the process, we'll essentially learn how to build an AR platformer as well so you could make games out of that. Now there's too much to live code, so instead we're going to go through three major concept areas that I already built to make this demo work. The user interface, the cat behavior, and also augmented reality via ARKit. Now if you want to follow along and have this project for yourself, I do not recommend that you try to copy the code from this video. Instead, look at the description and you'll see that I posted a link to a GitHub project. Download that and you can go from there. So with that, let's dive right in and get started with the UI. Our UI is pretty straightforward. It's a few buttons and also the joystick. But before we jump into that, I want to give you a basic understanding of the entire project via the hierarchy. So our plain painter paints the floor for our cat or our pet to walk on. The camera parent handles the AR camera. The canvas handles our UI. The cat model handles the cat's model. And the debug game object is off by default, but you can turn it on and turn off the camera parent if you want to do some tests inside of the Unity editor. Now on the point of the UI, we'll skip um, positioning the buttons because that's just very mechanical work that you need to do. Um, but the key point here is that in the button component, we configured a script that we want to get a function from when the button is pressed. So for example, on set pet, we have this cat script that has a, um, a set position function on it. It's actually um, a, the pet control script, but it's attached to our cat game object. So each of these buttons actually has a function that they're running on that pet control script that we'll talk about later. What's more interesting from the UI perspective is our joystick. We got the idea for this joystick from an online tutorial we found for Unity on a virtual joystick from, I don't know how to pronounce this name, but it looks pretty cool. So if you want a step-by-step -step guide, definitely go there, but we'll just give you a whirlwind tour of how we made this thing work. So there's a background and a foreground. As we click around, this white circle will move based on our click, and that's all being done via this joystick script. So in here, at the top, First of all, we create an event for the joystick being moved so that other objects can listen to when our joystick is updating. They listen via getting the joystick axes, so they figure out how far offset it is, and then they can apply motion to whatever game objects they're controlling. Now for this script to listen to screen taps, we implement these different interfaces up here, and those give us access to on pointer down, on pointer up, and on drag. Now on drag actually does the meat of our work. Uh, for example, on pointer down simply routes to on drag. What goes on here is that first of all, we want to check if the pointer is positioned on the joystick when we detect the touch. Um, next, we want to clamp the position so that we're inside of the bounds of the gray background part of the joystick. The reason we need this is if we don't have it, it's possible to click on the joystick and then drag the white circle off of the background. Now, getting towards the end, what we do is we normalize the axes of the joystick between to be between negative 1 and 1. We don't want wild values like negative 50 or positive 75 because that makes it really hard to then apply this as an input to game objects throughout the scene. The last thing we do is we update the position of the inner white circle depending on the joystick axes. And we do some normalization so that we can get the white inner circle to be on a circle bounds rather than have it be between the negative one and one of our joystick axes. So there you have it. That's everything for how we're handling the different events. And the last point to keep in mind is that an update that's where we're actually calling the joystick moved event for anything that's listening. The rest of this is some helper functions that you can dive into if you want to see everything. Uh, but if you want to see all of it from scratch, we also recommend checking out this tutorial. Now, let's talk about the star of the show, the cat. I gotta say, as cheesy as it looks, I love this cat. So much so that when I saw it on the asset store, it convinced me to go from making a dog tutorial to making a cat tutorial. It also helped that it was free. Now the controls for the cat are pretty simple and they're all tied to one script. You can see them inside of the cat object. 
on pet control. Now here I'm going to talk through the, the high level points for this um, pet control script to work out. You'll see that right off the bat we're subscribing to the joystick move method or event that I just talked about and we respond with this update move method. So as the joystick is moving we can then get the joystick input and apply it to the cat. So let's go to that update move. One of the first things that we want to do is we want to check if the joystick input is actually zero. This happens when someone releases the joystick and in that case we don't want to actually move the cat. So you can see that we set a float of the speed hash to zero. So what the heck is that? If you haven't worked with animators that might be a little bit confusing, um, but a speed hash is just an integer representation of an animator parameter. So we have this speed parameter that I'll go through later and we're hashing it to this integer. Um, it's a little bit more efficient than using the speed every time. So if we scroll back down to update move, here we're just updating the speed in our animator to zero because there is no motion. Now, if there is motion, we have a little more work to do. First, we have to get the input axes from the joystick. So we're doing that here, and then we're setting the float for the speed parameter based off of the magnitude of that input. Then we need to make sure that our cat is looking in the right direction because what we're going to do next is actually move it forward based on the power of that input. So we get it to look in the right direction in this set look direction method. Here we get the camera's Y rotation, rotate our input axes, so what we got from the joystick, by that rotation so that we can get up, down, left, and right according to the camera's perspective rather than the pet's perspective. Now that's a stylistic choice. You might want the joystick to work relative to the actual um, character, but we thought it was a little more natural for it to work relative to the camera, and we're making that camera-based um, movement possible by getting the look direction here. After that, it's as simple as just updating the position of the pet. Just move it a little bit forward using something along the lines of this. So we're adding onto its local position, it's forward multiplied by the magnitude of the input and uh, time that delta time so that it doesn't zoom too far ahead. So that's the majority of how we're making this thing actually move through space, but to handle the motions we're using an animator that is on this cat. So I won't go through all of the details here either, but at a high level what we have is an idle motion, a walk motion, and a run motion that all come with the cat. So the way that we transition between these is by changing that speed parameter that I talked about. So you can see that here, if speed's greater than zero, we go from idle to walk. And then when speed gets less than 0.1, we go back from walk to idle. To go from walk to run, we need speed greater than 0.35. And you can decide these all on your own, too. Um, as you're changing this, just go for what looks right to you. A key point to keep in mind, though, is that on these transitions, we turned off exit time. And also, on the animations, I turned on looping. So let me show you that. So you can see that all of these have looping turned on so that they will keep going through those animations while they're in these states. So Unity animations can be really fun. They can also be a pain. Uh, so you have these ones to work with as a start, but definitely feel free to extend if you're interested. Now, to close out everything, um, let's show this actually working uh, just in the Unity editor. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how we got the AR side working. So to show it in the Unity editor, I just unchecked camera parent for um, the AR camera so that we don't have augmented reality working and I turned on debug, so now we have a default plane and camera that we can use. Let's see how this works out. I'm going to hit play now. Probably going to take a little while to load, um, but what we'll see is we'll have a view of our cat, we'll have the joystick and all of our input. Looks like we don't have a view of our cat. That might just be because we need to reposition this camera. Let's see where it's at. Oh yeah, so it's on the floor right now. Let's move it back a bit, up. And now when we go to our game view, you can see that we have everything configured here. So it looks like there is one problem, and that's that this camera is not tagged as a main camera. So let me tag that. 
also need to move it again because I was making those changes in play mode. So you're seeing some live debugging here. The key point is that when you're in play mode, if you haven't used Unity much before, um, don't make your changes in play mode because they don't get saved. So I actually need to move this camera outside of play mode. I'm going to move it back, move it up a bit. Again, let's check this main camera. And now when I hit play, it's going to take a little while to load again, but I'll be able to use the joysticks as we planned. So here it is. You see that we have this cat running around, and you can also check out what the scale up and scale down functions are doing, but that's how we can change the cat's size. And then we also have a little hop button. Uh, we call it jump. If you want to make it a true jump or a really big leap, then just change some of the forces that we're applying in that function. Now, let's move on to augmented reality. The AR component was the easiest part of this whole demo. Uh, and I can show you that first by unchecking this debug that we had on before and reactivating the camera parent. Inside of camera parent, we have our AR camera, which is just the default AR camera that you can find inside of most Unity AR kit examples. So we have the camera manager and the AR video script on there with the correct um, things selected for their camera and clear material. So there's nothing special there. We also have a plane painter, and there's not that much that's special here either. But you will see that we've attached this Unity AR Generate Plane script. That's a default script that is also in Unity AR Kit. And what it does is it creates a virtual representation of the planes that we detect in the real world. On those virtual surfaces, we draw these planes that you saw in the tutorial. The only change that we made was we updated the collider to be a little bit more thick. Now, the reason why these are important is that they let us know where our pet can walk. If we walk outside of one of these debug planes, that means we're walking onto a surface that ARKit has not yet detected, so the pet will actually fall off. Now, to actually spawn the pet, we do something interesting, or at least worth looking at, inside of our canvas. You can see on spawn button, when it's pressed, we call this pet control set position function. So let's look at that to close out the tutorial. What we do in set position is we project from the middle of our iPhone screen to look for a hit point on the surfaces that we've detected with ARKit. So to project from the middle of the screen, first of all, we have to get a middle of the screen point, which is what we do here. And then we convert that to a viewport position. And then we convert that to an AR point. That's just a workflow that you'll see in a lot of ARKit examples. After we have that AR point configured, then we can actually run the hit test, which we do here. Here's that AR point, and we can determine what type of hit test we want to do. For this, we're looking to do a hit test on existing surface planes within their bounds. So we use this plane using extent type. And then if we get a hit, what we do is pretty simple. We just reset the rotation of our pet, and we change the position of our pet to be wherever that position was, and that's all there is to it. So to quickly summarize, we talked a little bit about the UI and setting up the canvas. We talked about how we could make our pet move around, especially based off of the camera's rotation. And then we saw that after that, the AR kit layering is pretty easy. So that's all, folks. Grab our code if you're interested, and thanks for following along this far. If you've enjoyed this tutorial, please leave a like, and also consider subscribing to our channel. It's a big help to us. I'm Hassan, and happy building. Thank you.